Amen. Psalms 128 is where we're going to start. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord that walks in his... Let me just try that one more time. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord and walks in his... Ways. ways. There's a certain way that you can walk to be blessed. I'm glad to know there is. I said, I'm glad to know there is. There is a way that you can walk in your life. There are principles you can apply. There are decisions you can make. There are steps you can take to where you'll be blessed. And verse 2 says, Thou shalt eat the labor of your hands. Happy shall you be. How many of you want to be happy? How many of you want your kids to be happy? Happy shall you be, and it'll be well with you. Then verse 3 says, Your wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of your house. Your children, like olive plants, round about your table... Behold, thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. This is amazing promises to us that, you know, when it says fear the Lord, that means you respect him and re you revere him enough that you actually are a doer of what he said in his word. Now, there's a lot of converts to Christianity, but there's not a whole lot of people that, that actually are disciples of Jesus. This is talking about people who hear the word of God, and they walk in those ways. It becomes a part of their lifestyle, their decision-making, their thinking. That's how they do life. That's how they treat their family, how they treat their husband, how they treat their wife, how they treat their kids, how they treat the people they have in business. Everything about them is reflective in this kind of person because it says they walk in his ways. This sounds exactly like what Jesus said in John chapter 8. He said, it says this, verse 30, and he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if, everybody say if. if, 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 if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So you can see right here that we have a problem. There are people that believe on Jesus, but the, the principle is you have to continue in his word if you're going to be a disciple. And the benefits of the Bible and the 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 great promises and the great life that it gives you is only for disciples. It's only for disciples. Because the next verse says, you'll know the truth. How will you know the truth? Well, if you continue in his word, if you continue in the word, whatever the word says, if that's a dominating factor of your life, then it says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Free from what? Everything that messes your life up. Everything that'll destroy your life, destroy your health your attitudes. It'll make you free. It'll set you free from selfishness. One of the great plagues of society is selfishness, self-centeredness. Me. What about me? It'll set you free. You'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. So God wants your, your marriage to be amazing. Most people don't have an amazing marriage. They have, you know, maybe an uh, average marriage or whatever. Uh, God's plan is for your marriage to be extraordinary, extraordinary. And it can be. It can get better as you learn to apply God's Word and walk in His ways. So we thank God for that, and that's what we're going to be talking about, some things that will really help you. You know, in our culture, there is a uh, crisis. Uh, we have a uh, progressive movement in the United States trying to destroy the family, trying to uh, say that it makes no difference, trying to change what a family is, what God's design was, and it's uh, because the very foundation of a successful nation, a successful life, has to do with a, with a covenant between a man and a woman and how they raise their kids and how they serve God. And that's the foundation of a successful uh, country, whatever that it is. So God has a plan that works, and it's the only plan that works. It's one man marrying one woman and raising their kids in a godly atmosphere. God knew what he was doing, and if we'll follow his ways, then we'll have success in that. Um, the divorce rate is about 50%, a little bit more for Christians, they say, because a lot of people that are non-Christian, they don't even, uh, they don't bother to get married, so it kind of skews the numbers a little bit. But 50% of the people who claim to be Christians, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, 50% of them uh, end up in divorce just like the, the people in the world. But what is interesting, if you look a little deeper in the statistics, you find out there are some great changes. That if you study the people that attend church regularly twice a week, two times a week, they have regular prayer and Bible reading in their home. If you add that in the mix, then the divorce rate is one in every 300. 
That's a little better than one out of two, ain't it? So I'm just saying there is a way. There is a way that you can raise your family, that you can, that you can live your life and have your marriage, and it can be wonderful and it can be great. Vel and I, you know, we've been married, uh, well, tomorrow, 41 years. We're celebrating 41 years tomorrow. And uh, as I've said before, I'm going to have to have a wagon that I pull behind me in heaven because my crown is going to be so big, I just have to pull it behind me for 41 years. And she said she's going to have to have a U-Haul for her crown. So that's probably a little truth in that. But anyway, so, so it can get good. I mean, life is good. I enjoy my marriage, my family. It's amazing. It says your children will be like all the plants around about your table. Your wife like a fruitful vine that you'll be blessed and you'll be happy. You can have a life like that and you can end your life that way, an amazing life, and that's what God has for you. Um, fatherhood is amazingly important. I know that we live in a culture that likes to act like, well, you don't even need a man, who cares? Well, uh, God does, and he designed a system that works. And uh, when you take the father out of the family, the statistics are staggering on what the adverse consequences are. Um, Fatherless homes. Here's some statistics. Children in fatherless homes are four times more likely to be poor. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway kids are from fatherless homes. 85% of all young people in prison, 85% are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts, fatherless homes, Girls are 711% more likely to be teen moms and 92% more likely to be divorced. It's interesting. But if you bring a father and a mother together and they're raising their kids for Christ, just bring the dad into the mix. This was very interesting. From, uh, you know, promise keepers and then the Baptist press. They run all kinds of statistics and try to follow up on families and find out. And it says, if a father does not go to church... If the father doesn't go, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will be regular worshipers when they grow up as adults. One in 50. If a father goes to church regularly, regardless of what the mother does, that's interesting, 67 to 75% of the children will attend church as adults. If the father takes the lead, and he, he sets that example. That's incredible. Uh, godly fathers, then, they have a huge impact upon children. They have a huge impact upon culture, and there's a lot of other statistics. If the father gets saved first in a family, the father gives his life to Christ and starts leading the family in Christ, it's like 90-some-odd 90, 90 percent of the, the wife and the kids that the, of the family will follow the father into Christianity. And, I mean, it, uh, for the mom, if she gets saved first, there's still a, a pretty significant amount, but it's nothing like if the dad does. Fathers are important, and fatherhood's important, and, and so we need to honor fathers. And uh, So I, wanna, I want your marriages to be amazing, and I want the dads to, to be committed to their wives for the rest of their life, and I want the women to know what the Bible says that will help you to provide an environment where your husband wants to come home. I mean, you, you want him to come home, don't you? Somebody's like, I'm not real sure about that. Well, I'm just saying, no. <laughs> you want your marriage to last. You want it to be one that stands the test of time and to get where God wants you to get. And no matter where it's at right now, you can take it, you know. Sometimes I say when I'm counseling, if your marriage is a two, what do you got to do to get it up to an eight? And I'll listen to him, and then I'll write down, here's what you need to do. What do you got to do to get it up from a two to an eight? So wherever it's at, uh, you can get your marriage to where it's much better than it has been. And so I'm going to give you some things, especially ladies that, that, that are going to help you to, to be sure that you have the proper attitude towards your husband and it's going to be a blessing to him and he'll want to stay home. So I'm going to give you this. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, four things. I'm going to be pretty fast with them, but very, very thing. If you'll do these four things, it says walk in his ways and this will be the kind of life you have. These are very crucial things that you can do. Number one, start with respect. Everybody say respect. Now, you know, on Wednesday, Chris taught a message on love and respect from Dr. Egrich's book, and, and it was very good, and, and so I'd recommend you get that. I don't have time to do that, all of that whole teaching, but, but respect is so important for a man. His, it's, he's wired that way, 
And uh, Ephesians chapter 5, notice what it says here. Now, this is instructions about the husband loving the wife and, and then the wife respecting her husband. It says, Never, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, you know, it talks about how, how Christ gave himself up for the church and, and a husband should give himself up for his wife and love his wife as Christ loved the church in the preceding verses here. And so that means the husband needs to put his wife first, put his kids first above himself. But then it emphasizes this and says, uh, the wife must respect, respect, everybody say respect, her husband. Very, very interesting. Um, you know, uh, I, I, in this book by Dr. Egrich, he made this statement, after 30 years of counseling couples without respect from her, he reacts without love. Without love from him, she reacts without respect. And he calls it the crazy cycle. And he says, once you get on the crazy cycle where he feels disrespected, then he's going to be unloving. When she feels unloved, she'll be disrespectful. And he says, if, you don't, if you, somebody don't break the crazy cycle, then everything's going to come flying apart. And we, so, we see so many people that they're in this crazy cycle of, well, I tell you what, well, you, you know, you, you're going to have to do something. You know, I, I thought this was kind of funny. A, a, a mother, she thought she was being clever, and it was probably a pretty good idea. She had two, uh, two sons, you know, and, and she was fixing breakfast, and she was getting the pancakes ready, and, you know, so they're arguing over who was going to get the first pancake. And one of the brothers said, I'm getting the first one. I'm the oldest. And said, no, I'm the young. I need to. And so they're arguing about this. So the mother was going to be real spiritual. And she said, uh, well, I just, want, I just want to ask you this question. If Jesus was here, he would give his brother the first pancake. And the older brother turned and said, okay, you be Jesus. <laughs> I mean, she was on the right track, but he was already thinking, you be Jesus. He wanted that pancake. Okay. Love, love and respect. Without love from her, she reacts without respect, and without respect to him, he reacts without love. And it, it starts this thing in, in a, a, a huge mess, and it just can create all kinds of strife and conflict. Respect, in the Greek word, means exceeding reverence. In fact, it, it goes even beyond that. I mean, I don't know, we, don't, we, don't, we have words, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say make people mad. Exceeding reverence is all I can say is what this word respect is. Being very honored, honorable to this individual, exceeding reverence. Webster's Dictionary defines respect as to consider worthy of esteem, to honor, to refrain from obtruding upon. And, you know, that would be like, what do you mean, don't obtrude upon? It means like if you go to the... You know, if you go to the, the grave, you know, or the cemetery, you don't just walk on people's graves and stomp around out there and sit on their gravestones. You don't, because of respect for the people who are there. It's the reason we don't, we don't walk on the American flag. It's out of respect for the men that died to give us the freedom that we have here in this country. So you don't, you don't, you, you're respectful about some things. Well, well, you don't obtrude upon them. But a lot of ladies, because of the way they were raised or they weren't taught, they weren't raised in church, maybe they were raised in a family that did this, I mean, they'll scream and holler at their husband and belittle him and call him names and tell him he's stupid. Well, if you do that, that's so disrespectful, there's no possible way. Yes, you can do that. You can do that. Nobody's going to make you not do that. But... Even God's not going to make you not do that. He'll let you be as disrespectful to any person as you want to be. He's not going to stop you from doing that, not now. But what happens is you're never going to have the marriage and the family that God intended. So if you want to get it from wherever it's at to amazing, you have to add this element of I'm going to be respectful. And it's amazing how you can turn him around when you start showing him respect and honoring him. Not because he's always right or he's always wonderful, but because of what God told you to do in his word. Can I get an amen from you? So it, it just begins to change everything. When he feels respected, then he'll be much more loving and caring about you. Uh, Titus chapter 2, notice what it says here, verse 
4 and 5, and it's talking about older women teaching younger women, and it says, so that they may encourage the young women to tenderly love their husbands and their children, to be sensible and pure and makers of the home where God is honored. How many of you want a home where God is honored? Well, I, I mean, then that's going to require love from the husband and respect from the wife. It says, be sensible, pure makers of a home where God is honored, good natured, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. See, it's, it, God is the one who said you need to be in submission to your husband. He's the one that said you need to respect your husband. And when you disobey what he said, you're dishonoring God. Are you here? When you disobey any commandment in the world, you're dishonoring the one that gave the commandment. Are you here? So, so that screws everything up then. So when you start saying, no, I'm going to obey what God said, because God said it, not because I feel like it, not because I think this, not because I think that, but because of what God said, then I'm going to give respect to my husband. When wives out of obedience to God's word give respect to their husbands, listen, they will see much more loving, caring attitude from their husbands. Just respect. So, so the criticism and the complaining and the name calling and you, I told you to take out the trash. You're so stupid. What, the, the little put downs and the innuendos and you can't ever do anything right and just, I'm not going to do what you say. You got you to empty all of that junk out of the trunk and you got to learn to operate in the God kind of love and you got to show respect. Can I get an amen from you? And I tell you what, you start respecting him. He wants, listen, let me, let me just, wives, let me tell you something. Your husband wants to be a great husband. Now, he may not know how. He may not know how. But he, he, wants, he wants to be the knight on the horse. He, that's what he wants to be. He was wired to be that. And he, he wants to be a great provider. He, wa he wants his family to be blessed. But, but he may not know how. But, but one thing that will help him turn the situation around is if in spite of whatever, if you'll stop the merry-go-round of craziness and just start being respectful, it starts changing everything. So we need to have love. Everybody say it out loud. Love and respect. All right. Second thing is this. Wives, this, this is going to help so much. And, and husbands, this will help your wife so much. Appreciate and encourage. Everybody say it out loud. Appreciate, Appreciate. and encourage. encourage. I mean, everybody needs a little bit of encouragement and appreciation. Appreciation goes a long way. Just saying thank you. I appreciate what you do, and thank you for doing that for me, and, and I appreciate that. 1 Peter chapter 3, very interesting. This is good for young men to read, good for everybody to read. Maybe it gives you a clue on who you should look for. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate, not as inferior. Women are not inferior to men. We just have different roles. We have different roles. Not as inferior, but out of respect for the responsibilities entrusted to husbands and their accountability to God. You, know, you understand that, men, you're going to give an accountability to God for how you raise your family, what priorities you had in your family, what you allowed to come into your home, and there's, you know, the Bible talks about there'll be more severe judgments for certain things. Like if you're a Bible teacher, if you're a pastor, you'll have a more of a severe judgment, more strict than other people. I mean, I don't like that, but that's just a fact. That's just the way it is. Well, the husband, he's going to be under a more of a strict judgment for what went on in his house and how he acted and how he treated I mean, the day's coming because he'll have to give accountability to God and so partnering with them so that even if some do not obey the word of God, they may be won over to Christ without discussion by the godly lives of their wives. Wow. When they see your modest and respectful behavior, what's going what's to turn the tide? This guy, he wasn't raised in church. Maybe he's a jerk. What's going to turn the tide? He's not obeying the word. 
He's not being, he's not being loving. He's not obeying the word, pastor. Okay. Well, well, he can be won over. You have the ability. It's amazing. I, I mean, I, I almost don't want to tell you, but wives have a huge ability to influence their husband. Huge ability. Because we have this where we want to please. We want to do right. We want to, we want to help. It's in us to protect and to serve. It's there. It's the, it's the way we like the movies. We want to see... We want to see the, the John Wayne come in and kill all the bad guys and, and defend the little, you know, the little woman over here and her child. We want to, that's, that's what men want to do. That's why we have AK-47s at our house. <laughs> Don't come to my house. I will. I'm going to protect. But it says, when they see your modest and respectful behavior together with your devotion and appreciation... Love your husband. Notice what it says. Encourage him and enjoy him as a blessing from God. Your adornment must not be merely external with interweaving and elaborate nodding of the hair and wearing gold jewelry or being superficially preoccupied with dressing in expensive clothes, but let it be the inner beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, one that is calm and self-controlled. In other words, he says, ladies, I mean, it's good to look, we want you to look good, we want you to look nice, but that shouldn't be the main focus of your life is how the outward man is. It needs to be what's on the inside and that attitude and that respectful behavior and being kind and being peaceful and being gentle. He says, man, that's, that is a very, notice what it says here, very precious. Everybody say very precious. I mean, he said, this is God talking. He says, this is very precious in the sight of God, this inward thing. So for the young guys in here, and maybe old guys, I mean, if you're looking for a, a wife, you need to not just look on the outside and the outside of the package. Sometimes the outside of the package can look really nice. They, especially the ones that like to really push the outside of the package. Sometimes the inside of the package is not so good. Did you enjoy that? I'm going to do that again. Sometimes <laughs> if they're really flaunting the outside of the package, the inside of the package is not so good. Can I get an Amen. So that means, boys, you need to look a little bit closer. Huh? You need to look a little bit closer. What kind of attitude do they have? What kind of personality do they have? What kind of attributes do they have? Are they Jesus disciples and followers of him? Or do they just have the external, which will change? And let me, can, can I be blunt? I mean, I never am in church. I try to really tone it down. <laughs> You're bracing yourself, I can say. <laughs> okay, so, so you won't care. I'm going to come down here. Let me get down here. You won't care, guys. You won't care how gorgeous and beautiful she is if she's a nasty snot <laughs> and belittles you after a little while. You may think she's a sex goddess at first. But when she has a nasty attitude, you won't want to be around her. Amen. Are you here? Yeah. You better look a little bit deeper. Can I get an amen? amen? You better look a little bit deeper. Amen. That was good. Praise the Lord. That's good pastoral preaching. Hallelujah. I'm coming up. I'm coming back. All right. Where was that? I forgot. I got off of my notes. I don't know how that happened to me. So appreciate and, encourage your, appreciate and encourage your husband. Men are like little boys and big hairy bodies. You can brag on a little boy and get him to do anything. I mean, you ought to know that. That's true. You start bragging on your husband. My wife is so smart. I mean, if she's wanting something, I don't know. She just, I think it's the devil. I don't know. No, it's not really the devil. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, if you... 
I know things are a little tight now, but I know as smart as you are that if you really work hard, you'll be able to buy me that purse. <laughs> well, it makes me want to do it. Are you here? I mean, because we want to be, we want to, that's, that's how we're wired. We want to be the, we want to be the hero. He wants to be, he wants to be that. Will you help him be it? And if he's struggling to meet, if he's struggling in the family, if he's struggling in his job, if he's struggling with something, you be there to encourage and lift him up and let him know you love him and you appreciate him and you'll make him much better than he could ever be. You'll take a loser and make him a lion. You encourage him, you lift him up, you help him. And I mean, you can make that guy want to be, he'll go to work, you bragged him up and told him how good looking he is. And even if you have to lie, just put a little bit on there. And just, I mean, how smart he is and what all he can do and that God's with him. And I mean, he'll go to work and he'll be the best salesman they've ever seen. He'll be the best at whatever it is because you encouraged him and kiss him goodbye in the morning. Are you here? I mean, you know that the insurance companies did a study on that? And men that their wife kisses them goodbye in the morning live five years longer. And I always say, if a kiss will get you five, what will get you ten? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I want to live a long time. <laughs> Encourage your husband. Amen. Proverbs 31, listen to this. Talking about, you know, we call it the virtuous woman. Proverbs 31, verse 10 says it this way, an excellent woman, one who is spiritual, notice what he put first, spiritual, capable, intelligent, and virtuous, who is he who can find her? Apparently, women like this are very rare. They're very rare. And it makes them extremely valuable. Her value, it says, is more precious than jewels and her worth is far above rubies or pearls. It's pretty amazing. The heart of her husband trusts in her with secure confidence and he will have no lack of gain. She comforts, encourages, and does him only good and not evil all the days of her life. So, so part of your job, you comfort him. If things go bad, if there's a downturn, if, you know, we have all this crazy world going on and, yeah, stuff happens and some businesses have, have really suffered and some people are not able to do what they were doing, but you be there to comfort him. Don't put, don't put pressure on him. You put praise on him. You encourage him and you lift him up and you say, God's with us and God's going to help us. And I tell you what, God's on our side and I'm speaking the word and I'm praying over you and I tell you things are going to change and all of a sudden there's going to be a door open and you're going to be more blessed than you've ever been. You're going to have more opportunity than you've ever had because God is with us. And you encourage and you lift him up and you comfort him. And I tell you what, it makes all the difference. Everybody needs to be encouraged. And that goes for your husbands. You need to encourage your wives. Don't just criticize them and run them down and say, well, you do this and you do that. Why would you? No, encourage and lift them up and tell them you love them and you appreciate them. It goes a long way. I appreciate my wife. I mean, she's been a great blessing and a help to me for all of these years. I couldn't do what I'm doing if she hadn't have been there by my side. And any test or any trial we've went through, she's always been right there to encourage and, and comfort me and to help me to get through. Encourage. Be a blessing and be a comfort to your husband. I tell you what, Daddy will love to come home. Can I get an amen from you? Amen. Second thing, oh, I'm on the third thing. Third thing is this, be cheerful. Be cheerful. Be cheerful. Are you a cheerful woman? Are you a cheerful man? Are you cheerful? Do you have any cheer? Be cheerful. Proverbs 21, 19. It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry Some of you didn't even know that was in the Bible. That's in the Bible. God said that. He was looking down. He said, whoo, man, I be, be sure that gets in there. I just want to put that in there. <laughs> it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious. That means somebody who was argumentative. Modern translations say quarrelsome. You know, we've had, we've had quarrels about colors. 
she thinks there's way more colors than there are. <laughs> blue, there's blue, okay, and there's, okay, there's orange and there's red, and, 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 but she, she invents colors. She just makes up a bunch of stuff. I'll say, that's blue. She says, no, that's chartreuse or some other something. She comes up with some other color. I'm thinking, what is the matter with you? Can't you see that's blue? My clothes. She'll say, well, I, I say, well, that's just blue, and that's blue, and that's blue. She says, but that's a different color blue than that. That blue don't match that blue. <laughs> get over the colors. Just get over the colors. There's not that many colors. <laughs> be cheerful. Be cheerful. Don't be contentious. Don't be quarrelsome. Don't be belligerent. Jesus said in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But he said, uh, I know there's tribulation and things are going to go wrong, so just go ahead and be in a mad, bad mood sometimes. He says, no, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I, I didn't give you the scripture. You're, you're ahead of me. I haven't got to there yet. So be of good cheer. Jesus said so. I, I mean, you heard about the, the church. I mean, sad. I mean, the devil appeared in church one time. Not this church, but in another church. And he appeared in church and everybody's panicking and they're running out. And there was, but one guy just kept sitting on the on the seat there, and the devil came up to him and said, I'm the devil, aren't you scared of me? He said, no. He said, uh, I think I married your sister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Be cheerful. Galatians chapter 5, notice what it says. Now we'll talk about the fruit of the Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. One translation says the Spirit produces in human life fruit such as these. Love, what's the next thing? Joy. Everybody say joy. I mean, nobody wants to come home to somebody who's mad and angry. Wife don't want to come home if the husband's there and he's mad and angry. Husband don't want to come home if a wife is mad and angry and quarrelsome. Who wants to be in an environment like that? We need to be, we need to have joy. We need to have cheerfulness in our life. We need to have fun. It's all right to have fun. You used to have fun when you were dating. Well, have fun now that you're married. Do some fun things together. As a family, have some fun. Are you here? Be cheerful. I mean, the joy of the Lord is your... Well, you need to have joy in your home. It needs to be a haven, a place where the kids want to be there and dad wants to be there and mom wants to be there. It needs to be some fun in the house. and You need to be a cheerful type person. And I understand there's different personality types, but, but you can grow and the fruit of the Spirit begin to dominate your life to where you have cheerfulness. And you're just cheerful. Amen? Not grumpy. Not grouchy. Somebody said, well, I can't help it. I have premenstrual. And then some people have postmenstrual. In the middle, they got menstrual. I mean, they're messed up all the time. <laughs> My God, get healed. <laughs> don't, don't, be, don't be grumpy. Don't be grippy. Be cheerful. Everybody say, be cheerful. be cheerful. Amen. And I mean, he'll want to come home then. He wants to be in an environment like that. Kids want to be raised in a home where there's joy and there's peace and everybody's getting along and they love each other. And they have a right to be living in a house like that, not where there's fussing and fighting and quarreling. So you're going to help your husband so much create an atmosphere that where you're cheerful. Last thing is this, have a good sex life. So you talk about sex in church? Somebody's already cheering me on here, is there? <laughs> That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, notice, so, so they wrote a letter to Paul. The Corinthians wrote a letter to him, and he's answering them about sex. And first he says, it's not, it's not good to be touching a woman to set her on fire if you're not married. Don't be doing that. And uh, so, I mean, for teenagers, I mean, they can't even touch. They can't even hold hands. They're setting them on fire. I mean, their they're hormones are sort of out of, out of control, so... We, we have to really watch teenagers, okay? But it says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority, uh, most modern translations say exclusive authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. One translation says, but the husband has his rights and the wife has her rights. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. He's talking about depriving from sex, except for consent 
for a time. What, what, what for? That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So he says you go to your spouse and you say, I'm going to be fasting and praying for a few days here, so I want to abstain from sex for a few days. And so he says that's the only reason that he gives. But then he says come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So, so God instituted sex. Sex is for the benefit, you know, uh, of marriage. And, and it's part of, you know, men are wired to have sex. And they have a, a strong sex drive, much stronger than women when the, when the men are young. In fact, they say that a man, uh, in many cases, his sex drive is as strong as his drive for food. Did you know that? As strong as his drive for food. And I mean, if you don't think so, tonight just ask him, do you want sex or do you want supper? <laughs> and see what he says. I mean, he's, he's probably going to have sex and then he's going to sneak out and try to get something to eat. I know what he's going to have to do, but I'm just saying, I, I mean, you need, to, you, you need to be sure that you have a good sex life. In fact, in the book, His Needs, Her Needs by William Harley, it says the number one need of a man. And all of these, you know, classes they take and they're writing down, what are you looking for? The number one need of a man is to be sexually fulfilled by his wife. Number one, that's what he says, number one need. Men are motivated by sight. By sight. They don't have to have any kind of personal relationship with the person. Women are more motivated by relational response, primarily. Men are more motivated by sight. That's why, I mean, they, they can just, I mean, that's why they can go to a prostitute. They don't even know, and they, they still can have sex. So men are motivated by sight. I mean, you heard, you heard about the, uh, well, they were an Amish couple, and they'd never been into the city before, and they came in with their horse and buggy. They go into a big city, and I mean, in high rises and everything. So the mom gets out, and her daughters, and, and I mean, the, the dad gets out, and he's got his long beard, and he's looking all around, and, and the, uh, the mom says, we want to go to a, a, a clothing store to see some of the clothes. And so she takes the girls, goes across the street to a clothing store. And the dad and the son, you know, he's an older boy, and they, they're looking around. They decide they're going to go in a high rise. So they go inside the high rise and several floor, and they go in there, and they're standing there, and they're looking around, and they see this silver, looks like a silver panel. It has lights across the top of it. And the boy says, what is that? Dad says, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. And all of a sudden, an old woman comes up with a cane, and she goes up, and she pushes buttons on the front of that, and the doors open up. She steps inside, and the doors shut, and the lights come on. In a minute, the door opens up, and they look, and there's a beautiful young brunette in there. And the old man turns to his son and says, Quick, boy, go get your mama. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, men are motivated by sight. So you need to look good for your husband, but, but you need to have a good sex life. Um, God cares about all of that. Yeah, I, had a, I had an older guy come up to me, and he said, yep. I said, son, about that sex? He said, uh, see, how did he say that? He said, uh, a well-fed hound dog won't leave the porch to hunt. I'm just going to let you think about that, and then I, I'm just going to go on. Sex life is important. Are you here? And so, so, so you need to be sure that uh, you're meeting that need, and, and your family will be blessed. Dr. Kevin Lehman, we have his books in our bookstore in there. And he said this, very interesting. He said, in all my years as a therapist, I've never had one man, never had one man who had been respected, needed, and sexually fulfilled by his wife come to my office to seek a divorce. Not even one time. So if we can, if we can bring into our families, if we can bring respect, everybody say respect, Amen. encouragement, Amen. cheerfulness, Amen. and a good sex life. If you, if you have all of those ingredients, daddy's going to want to come home. It's going to be a blessing. God has an amazing life for you. He's got an amazing family planned. He wants, your, he wants the, the, the amazing plan that he had for husbands and wives to be transferred to their kids to where, you know, I can look back, see, it's been 41 years now, so, so I can see our life and I see how it's exactly what he said. But if you'll follow God's ways, you may start out and you don't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. 
but I became a disciple. I became a follower of Jesus. And as ignorant as I was and as self-centered and prideful and the habits I had and the, the lusts I had and all the garbage, as I became a follower of Jesus, it was just like he said that, that I became free. And I, I'm not saying I've hit a 100% mark. Nobody will in a human body. But I've greatly changed. And it wasn't me. It was the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working in my life. And I can say that my wife's like a fruitful vine by the side of my house. And I can say my children are like olive plants round about my table. And I can say God's Word works and I'm a happy man because God's principles, when you apply them in your life to the best of your understanding and ability, if you'll really be a disciple, it changes everything. Can I get an amen from you? I love you. I love all of you. I want your marriages to be so strong and so blessed. I hate divorce. God hates it. He loves you and he cares about you. And if you'll just make a few of these changes, depend upon the Holy Spirit to help you, life will get so much better. So. Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, don't forget to share it with your friends and family and click subscribe. For more information, you can head over to victoryfamilychurch.com or click the link below.